thank you so much, Thea. <laughs> it's really an honor and a pleasure uh, to be here. I always enjoy the opportunity to uh, tell the story of power structure research from its origins in the 50s uh, to the present. And uh, especially the theme of the conference is ideal. I would love it for power structure research to be a legacy for sociology, uh, having put 54 years of my own into it. Um, but I always think it's on the verge of being a relic, and that will be the theme of, of my talk. <laughs> so by power structure research, I mean the kind of work you find in Floyd Hunter's Top Leadership USA, in 1959, or his community uh, uh, power structure in 53, or C. Wright Mills, the power elite, various editions of Who Rules America uh, from 67 to 2014, and also these books depend on many very fine sociologists and, and some great work that they've done, and some political scientists as well, and there's now a rising younger generation, small but uh, excellent, doing this kind of research. And I do think that power structure research has made a great many contributions in understanding the American power structure. It's mapped the, the structure, the framework, the networks, uh, the ongoing institutions of the overall power structure at both the national and the local levels. It's shown how this particular power structure operates, the processes within it, how it works its will, how it gets its way, in seeming small ways and on very large pieces of, edu of uh, legislation uh, such as uh, passed in the New Deal like the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the Social Security Act, and even the National Labor Relations Act as far as its origins except that that particular act got away from the uh, power structure and uh, was put to its own uses, changed by liberals and labor and, and it was useful to everyday Americans for the next 40 years at least. And finally, the uh, field of power structure research has been able to trace and explain the considerable change that's always occurring and that occurred between 1935 and the present. But, as I already implied, despite all that success, it's always in danger of marginalization of becoming a relic, not a legacy. And how could that be? That's the first kind of topic I want to address. Now, there's no doubt several reasons. It's a very long and complex story, so I only want to highlight it here. But I first of all want to say that power structure research does not quite fit with either of the two great uh, Western, uh, the narratives of Western history about progress and eventual human harmony and happiness, equality, and so on. I'm referring to liberalism, talks about gradual changes, more democracy, more uh, equality. It's spoken of in sociology in terms of, and other social scientists in terms of volunteer groups, interest groups, political parties. In a word, in the social sciences, uh, it's pluralism. Everybody's part of it. We're pulling, yes, some have more power, but it's, it's going in that positive kind of direction. And there's another a great narrative of, of, of social change and eventual success, and it's embodied in Marxism. Even though there's growing crises and things are going to get worse for a while, there will be an inevitable class struggle. Uh, but in the end, there will be a very fine outcome called socialism, sharing equality, uh, and so on. Power structure research is uneasy within that context. It's a study that, of power that's rooted in organizationism. Pluralism, liberalism, uh, voluntary associations, they don't come first. Nor does uh, class and class struggle always be the privileged uh, uh, factors in, in social change. So, yes, organizations are a power base, is what I, my emphasis is. It is true, uh, as organizational theorists tend to emphasize, that they are functional, they are efficient, they, they, wouldn't have, they have tremendous advantages. Uh, but from a human point of view and a power structure point of view, uh, it's not all um, uh, peachy keen. Because in fact, these organizations can be turned into power bases, the people on the top can move people around, they put their friends in place, 
They can reward their friends on the outside. They can self-indulge and all of these kinds of things then lead to power structures. And there's a constant vigilance to keep a power structure at all accountable. And uh, the future is very uncertain uh, in that uh, context. Power structure research is also, as you're going to experience for many of you, uh, in your further education and maybe in graduate education, it fits a little uncomfortably in terms of our methodological uh, pigeonholes. Because, in fact, power structure researchers can't just go out and do surveys. They can't do more structured kind of interviews. I would characterize power structure research as often very opportunistic. It takes advantage of an accident, of a scandal, of a leak. Uh, it has to, every once in a while, get a hold of papers. Somebody else purloined per them, of course. But you get amazing uh, papers from these organizations that are then quite revealing about them, and usually just about the opposite of what they claim uh, about themselves. And, and there's a certain unseemliness of having a deep throat, a, a, uh, an informant uh, from the higher levels, uh, and to be relying on these insider uh, kinds of people. It seems, in a word, much too like investigative journalism somehow, and it, it doesn't fit uh, uh, our image. Well, what's the evidence? Why would I think that? Um, I'm just imagining it. And I, I would just like to very briefly tell you the fate of these people I mentioned earlier, Floyd Hunter and C. Wright Mills. Hunter was amazing. He had worked in a social agency in Atlanta, and then he started just going around asking people who's powerful, a method that got uh, called uh, the reputational method, because that, that, that's only a reputation for power. Hunter called it the take me to your leader method. He landed <laughs> on an island and met somebody and said, would you take me to your leader? So he asked a lot of people, would you tell me who your leaders are? And you know what? Within three or four rounds of asking those questions, you do know the leaders. Uh, it was very successful, uh, it was applied by a lot of sociologists that are now history, they aren't in the legacy, uh, very successfully at the uh, uh, local level. Hunter applied it at the national level in a book called Top Leadership USA. It made what made a believer, so to speak, out of me was when I did my kind of research, it had a big overlap with his, his uh, kind of list. Uh, and yet, he was so heavily criticized for this method that uh, most of you probably have never heard of him. He's not in the textbooks. And even when people went back to Atlanta and did further studies, thanks to political sociologists and political science, but even more recent archival uh, findings, you know, when you go into people's paper, when the papers 30 years later, he's been like totally vindicated. Uh, but he is not back in, in the, uh, the legacies of, of the. Uh, of sociology. And the same thing, what about Mills? Everyone has heard about Mills. Everyone probably uh, at least read parts of excerpts of the sociological imagination for him. <laughs> but by 1980, as I'm going to explain to you, his book called The Power League was never cited by the uh, social scientists um, uh, that I'm going to uh, talk about. And he would have been soon forgotten, I think, except if it were not for the social movements that began in the 1960s. Because they created the openings for power structure research within the academy. The SNCC and SDS had their own research for their own reasons. Uh, I remember a pamphlet called The Care and Feeding of Power Structures. And shortly after that, as part of the mobilization on campuses, by 1968, there was a pamphlet called Who Rules Columbia, partly based on documents after a sit-in that they'd gotten from the president's office. Go to school and learn to rule. That was about Yale University and its rule. How Harvard rules. All these pamphlets. So Hunter plus Mills plus these movement researchers made a book like Who Rules America possible and relevant. And it got read and reviewed and otherwise would not have. Who Rules America combined what I call social indicators with power indicators and then looked in standard research uh, uh, available sources, reference sources. Social indicators means uh, upper class standing. Uh, did you go to certain prep schools? Did you, are you in social, certain social clubs? Did you go to certain uh, exclusive resorts? Uh, debutante ball lists and so on. 
power indicators. That's wealth and income distribution, overrepresentation in organizations. Uh, and let me tell you about power uh, indicators in an inverse way. What if I said to you that 50% of the population is women and only 1% of the leaders are women? Does that tell us anything, perhaps? If 10% of the population are Af African Americans and 0% of the people are in positions of power, does that tell us anything? Well, that's rhetorical, of course, but the point is, if one half a percent of the population are in the upper class, and if they have 30% of the wealth and 30% of the corporate leadership seats, and that's all in the past, that, I think, tells us something. Uh, many pluralists did not agree. So the results of the early mapping that we did uh, are shown in the first graphic. You see a picture of three, it's a Venn diagram it's called, you've got a social upper class, you've got a corporate community, and you've got a policy planning network, and they'll be un understood as I unfold. And drawn from those networks is a power elite. Uh, so we have on the one hand, sure there's people in the upper class that just ride their horse and go to parties and take jets everywhere. Sure in the corporate community we have rising executives, we have vice presidents, and sure in the policy planning network as we'll see, we have hired experts. But the boards of directors, the boards of trustees of these, all these organizations, profit and non-profit, um, are com comprised of the power elite. At the end, I will even make a guesstimate of its size just to be uh, provocative. And by 1970, we had a good idea, as in uh, uh, graphic two, we had a good idea of the, how the big policies were made. Uh, I call that the policy planning network. Uh, in particular, there are policy discussion groups. And these groups, provide a setting in which these corporate leaders have an ongoing seminar where they go once a month and hear from experts about what's going on in China or if they're in a study group on trade, they go to the, those meetings. And these meetings also provide a forum where business guys can argue and discuss and iron out uh, their differences. And they're an informal training ground for new leadership. Hey, Joe from uh, St. Joe's paper, he really gets along well with experts. He seems to bring uh, discussions together well. It's the kind of thing you see in your own organizational setting. And in addition, they say, these groups have a, a three roles in terms of the rest of uh, us, the society. Now, they legitimate their members as a serious people who go to nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit meetings on their own time just to know about foreign policy. Uh, in these organizations, the young experts that go there soon learn what would be good to study to get grants. These guys also sit on foundation boards, the big guys that I'm talking about here. They were mostly big guys in the past, and some women now, but not a whole lot. Uh, and then they constantly have an output of books, journals, policy statements. Uh, they put op-eds in the New York Times and Washington Post, so they contribute to uh, the climate of opinion. Well, by 1970, we could put all of this in, into the network uh, you see in the next graphic, namely the Policy Planning Network. And, you know, it's not the time to sort of study that, uh, kind of a Rube Goldberg-like diagram. But the point is that we could map it, and then you could see, okay, new policy. Let's see if we can fit it into these organizations. Now, later we made uh, that graphic a little easier to adapt. To, to decipher, and, uh, and, and that's the next graphic. And in, you, you can see uh, uh, how it works, and very clearly, and may I say that recently uh, uh, sociologists have done books uh, and articles that say, hey, this really works for environmental uh, policies. It uh, also works for uh, the whole movement to create more and more uh, charter uh, schools. Now, by 1974, we could spell out the connections, the detailed set of networks between the upper class corporate community kind of network and the government. And there's four overlapping but distinct uh, processes. And they take us from the very specific to the very general. Again, without details, there's a special interest process, very narrow interest. This is lobbying. This is 
trying to jimmy the regulatory agency. This is trying to get in good with the committee that's writing the legislation. The policy planning process, that's what I've already mentioned. That's where uh, the people uh, get together, discuss, come out with these policy statements, and they move uh, towards government. We also differentiate, differentiated out at that point an opinion shaping network. Uh, it attempts, though. Human, uh, Americans have their own views, um, and they don't get changed by, by these um, uh, efforts by these people. But they're very general views. They usually don't involve specific legislation. People aren't following that closely. They have their lives to lead. They're uh, stem to stern for their day and keeping up with their job, their family, their loved ones, their interests. Um, but in that context, the policy, policy planning network is expert at creating doubt uh, about other views. Uh, they do present alternatives, and they certainly ridicule opponents through uh, the policy uh, the opinion shaping network. They spy on for inter interest animal rights activists. They infiltrate their organizations through, you know, through these cutout organizations, these uh, organizations they're financing uh, indirectly. And finally, there is a candidate selection process. That's how we bring the two political parties into the whole scene. Uh, it's, it's in part large campaign finance donations to both parties, but it's also uh, involves um, many of these experts and lobbyists working in people's uh, campaign. And at that point we did differentiate out a specific uh, uh, version of the uh, opinion shaping network, which is in a, a graphic there, uh, showing just how they reach both what's called the attentive public, the five or six percent that are maybe paying attention, and the more general public. Uh, there are little different avenues uh, on that. This research, which did have a lot of interest in the upper class as a social class, remember I talked about uh, social indicators, uh, that didn't, uh, wasn't ignored all of a sudden in the 1970s. We were always looking for opportunities to study, study these social groups, and I got a great opportunity accidentally through interviewing a person about his campaign finance donation, and he was a very liberal guy, but he was in a club called the Bohemian Club. Uh, north of San Francisco, uh, and um, they're in San Francisco, but they have a retreat called the Bohemian Grove on the Russian River, 75 miles or so north of San Francisco. Most people haven't heard of it unless they've lived in that area. But the point is, we were able to study that in great depth uh, through having their old records plus informants, and uh, including students that have worked there, so everybody I saw when I was working on this project they said, what are you up to? I said, I'm, stud I'm studying the Bohemian Grove. You ever heard of it? And somebody, I don't think so, but I think my friend may have maybe worked there. Can I meet your friend? Yeah. And so I had some great interviews um, with uh, these people. And the punchline of studying these social groups is from small group research in social psychology in the 1950s, in departments, incidentally, that had social psychology that were sociologically oriented and psychologically oriented in the same department, like at University of Michigan, that's all gone. But the point is that these people showed through little small group experiments that their physical proximity leads people to get to know each other. Uh, the, they know that the more people interact, the more they tend to like each other. Uh, if a group's seen as high status and you're joining it, oh boy, you uh, feel tighter with those members than you otherwise would, and a relaxed setting is best, as opposed to a tense problem-solving setting in terms of people getting to uh, like, know and like each other. So the punchline is social cohesion facilitates policy uh, cohesion, makes it possible to create policy cohesion. Well, all that's still pretty vague, right, uh, at least for most social scientists. So in a special issue of the insurgent sociologist, you can imagine what that journal was like, but we had a special issue on power structure research, and we put in some of the cutting edge stuff, including a great account by a woman who worked for one of these activist organizations, and they had just happened to get their hands on the minutes of meetings of big business with the Defense Department, and she wrote a great article for that particular uh, uh, issue 
never went into academia. She was always an activist. She was always, as she told me, more interested in convictions than theories. That is, let's nail these guys and put them in jail, was her, her interest. But in any case, in that issue, we did a more quantitative study where we mixed together uh, the bit members of 30 organizations, the social clubs and policy groups, and we used a measure for what's called centrality, who's in the, more the center in that network in terms of, of organization. And lo and behold, there's an organization called the Business Council, which was a precursor of something you may have heard of called the Business Roundtable. Another one of these policy discussion groups called the Committee for Economic Development. Then a club in New York called the Lynx Club, which is known as the corporate rendezvous of the American upper class, because if you're anybody in the corporate world, you go to New York on business, you're probably going to stay at the Lynx Club or certainly have lunch there or maybe go out to their golf course. Uh, you see the Council on Foreign Relations. That's where most of our State Department uh, uh, appointees uh, come from, and I see lots of other clubs like the Pacific Union in San Francisco, and this Bohemian Club, lo and behold, only number 11 in that uh, particular thing. But you notice, hey, I haven't uh, brought in any corporations yet into that network. What about specific corporations, uh, corporations in relation to all of this? Well, we published the answer to that uh, uh, question in 1983 in another special issue of a journal, this time called uh, social science history. It traced the history of corporate networks uh, from 1820, mind you, on into uh, 1970s. And one of the articles in there was by, uh, thanks to my uh, great under undergraduate research assistant at that time, a man named Hal Salzman, who went on to earn his PhD in uh, Brandeis in sociology and to study power in the workplace, micro power including in the uh, high-tech industry. And he now uh, is in a policy school at Rutgers, so I just tell you that because there is life after undergraduate school. Uh, just go one step at a time. So in the next graph, you can see what Hal and I found. And in this network, I had about 100 corporations. Uh, we also had um, several think tanks, policy groups, and cultural groups of various kinds, and universities. This is for the year 1970. And at the top, you see the top 25. There's IBM, then one of these policy groups, the conference, more than General Foods, then a bank that's now been absorbed um, into J.P. Morgan Chase called Chemical Bank, another one of these policy groups, then New York Life Insurance, then Yale University, and so on, down the list. And you can also see that uh, the rankings for types of groups uh, on this graphic and so you can see, for instance, under universities that MIT was the 24th in these 200 and some organization, um, that Harvard was 50th, and so on. You see something called the Rockefeller Foundation was 10th, and Ford Foundation, which is a big deal, was 69th. So you get a certain sense of the, of the network. Um, now, way down at the bottom right-hand corner, you see something uh, where it says the National Association of Manufacturers, 196th. Well, that's an organization of business that would plural should say, well, that's the key business organization. No, it isn't. And we, we've known that since the 70s. But when they talk about business, they mean the National Association of Manufacturers. Uh, but that was the 1970, that was 1970, right? What about now? I mean, that's ancient history. Well, we have a 2011 database. Um, that uh, thanks to a sociologist, University of North Dakota, Cliff Staples, hooray for Cliff, and he and I then made it um, a little more copacetic, and it's a detailed uh, uh, database. It's on whorulesamerica.net, and anyone's welcome to a copy. We're glad to share it. It's got 2,500 plus corporations, 82 major foundations, 33 think tanks, six policy groups. Uh, there's also so you can check, if you wanted to do the study, how those groups relate to private universities, 47 of them, 19 White House advisory groups. Uh, all that's there for future uh, research. So here I'm just going to highlight some findings on a quick series of graphics to give you a, a sense of it. Uh, you're going to see it's the same kind of result. So I also should begin by saying what you're going to see is a tour of what we call fictive space, fictional space, where 
we, the closeness of people who could be on the other side of the country but talk every day or see each other's meeting, but they're shown in a geographic way. In other words, the more they interact, so to speak, the more boards on there together, the closer they are in this geographic space. And so I started with a think tank called the Brookings Institution, very famous from the past. Uh, you, all you see is a blur of lines and uh, little squares. Uh, but the point is, it's a mix of, of corporations and organizations from the policy planning network. Uh, you can sort of see uh, that uh, Boeing is in there, that travels insurance, travelers and insurance is in there. But you can also um, go in there and, and zero in on a little closer, right? And so we see the Brookings Institution on the next graphic in bigger form. We see it's real close to the business roundtable. We see Boeing. We see travelers. We see the University of Southern California. Their trustees are not small potatoes in the uh, corporate world. We can also see it up close for another group that wasn't on the, our 1970 uh, radar because it was very small, but it grew from the 70s on. It's called the American Enterprise Institute. It's a more conservative group. We call it an ultra-conservative group. It's now, it's the new kid on a block, historically speaking, uh, but there it is right in the heart of the network in 2011, right close to the business council, close to the business round table, you see Caterpillar tractor, uh, you know, and so on. So there they are, uh, moved into the network. We tossed in one university uh, for today, uh, and that's Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Of course, MIT is very important in terms of uh, technological expertise, scientific advice, and so on. So the trustees of the University of Massachusetts are also the kind of people, or are also the people, I should say, who sit on Brookings Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, IBM, uh, Business Roundtable, uh, Business uh, Council. Now finally, in terms of this uh, whirlwind trip uh, through the graphics, and that's why, of course, they're on a handout, so you, you can look at them later. Um, is that, uh, what if we just look at those policy groups I mentioned and see how many overlapping members they have? What do we come up with in terms of, of a network? And what we see is that this business roundtable and business council are in the center. And they are, uh, their size of their importance is shown through the bigger circle. Uh, that, that's a degree of importance and effect or a degree of connection. Um, and so the point then is this business council to tell you is really an informal version of the business roundtable. Uh, they meet informally in the White House. They meet informal, for, informally in a resort area in, called Hot Springs, uh, Virginia, I think it is. And, uh, but the business roundtable is all business, you know, it's straight ahead. It, it puts out position papers uh, and its, it's CEOs go out and lobby uh, and so on. Uh, the other difference we need to is if you're in the business council and you retire as a CEO, you stay on the business council. If you retire as a CEO of a company and you were on the business roundtable, you leave the business roundtable. So there's a way in which the business council a little bit, you know, the sages and the business roundtable is, is the one that's in, in action. Um, it's metaphorically very uh, significant that that Committee for Economic Development is on the left. It's a little more moderate than the others. Chamber of Commerce is much more right-wing. And coming back to that National Association of Manufacturers, you see it up at the right-hand corner. It's small, and, and, it's, and it is way to the right. And you see on the top a thing called the Conference Board I haven't mentioned before. It's much more neutral. It's a place to hold meeting. They put out statistical reports and so on. So it's not really as much of a policy discussion group. Okay. So we've shown all that. Uh, and so I'd like now, by 20, it's still the same in 2011. So now I'd like to go back to the future. Uh, that is, put us back in the late 70s and early 80s. And at that point, I gotta admit, I thought that power structure was on a roll. Power structure research, it was really making it. Uh, books, special issues of journals, um, at least a dozen or more active uh, researchers but I was wrong. 
uh, which is not the first time I've been wrong. Um, because in, since then, it was at that time period was really sort of the beginning of marginalization and of, and of, of power structure research and of dwindling number of uh, power structure research. And uh, at this point, it's all but done, disappeared from uh, political sociology and from uh, intro, psychology, intro sociology kind of text. So what happened? Two kinds of things. Two things. One will be, I'll talk about under the rubric of structural Marxism and the other historical institutionalism. Now as to the Marxism, the Marxist version that was ascended in the 70s in a reassertive kind of way, it was a new generation of Marxists. Um, they were just out of grad schools. They were led by one elder, though, uh, who came in line in the late 50s and 60s, a famous economist of the era named James O'Connor, wrote a book called The Fiscal Crisis of the State. And basically they said that power structure research was superficial. It was supposedly on the personal level, it was just about a bunch of people, and which you've seen how I've used a bunch of people, um, and names and all that kind of stuff. Trace ties of individuals. And that was seen as you know, very low level kind of stuff. But of course there was really two levels. There was individual level and organizational level. Uh, you can't create those, create those networks without the both. And there's a great name for it. It's called a membership network analysis. And membership's the key word there because it implies individuals who are members. It also implies if, you're a me if there's membership, there must be something you are a member of that is an entity. So, of course, uh, it, it had uh, people and organizations. It was at what came to be called a, a two-network, hyper, hypermodal network, and so on. Some very fancy names in, uh, in uh, network analysis. But the, uh, as for what these, this particular generation of Marxists advocated, they said the issue was structure. And they called themselves structural Marxists, the word I used earlier. And specifically, it was the nature of capitalism that mattered and the structure of the economy that mattered. And so studying the Bohemian Grove policy, cohesion is facilitated by social cohesion. Not what are you guys wasting your time on that kind of stuff for? It's all much more structural. It moves at you know, a much higher kind of level. Uh, and as they saw it, capitalism was in a deep crisis at that time. It could only survive by uh, using the government more was called the state at that time, uh, to save capitalism. Furthermore, uh, there was a new moral economy developing in the rest of us uh, from below that was going to force the issue anyhow uh, and, and lead to a stronger welfare state. Here, what do I mean? I mean unionized workers, there was still such a thing. I mean the elderly, uh, because they were quite organized. Uh, that's what they meant too, I should say. It meant activists in movement including African Americans who were organized around issues of welfare rights and uh, minimum uh, uh, income maintenance and so on. Well, basically the irony is that the Reagan Bush one era, uh, George W. Bush's president, just to recall, was also the president after Reagan. So from 80, 80 to 92 should not have happened. It could not have happened. Uh, but that didn't stop them because you when you're in the middle of something, you don't see that you're in the middle of a sea change, except tracing who the people were and what, which organizations they came from. Power structure research said, wow, we're in the middle of, of, of a transition. Uh, and we wrote about it, but it was to no avail. So within a few years, though, most of the structural Marxists had, had disappeared. Uh, some had switched to topics uh, other talk, topics to study, and I won't name examples or name. Uh, others uh, drifted into neoliberal theory. Uh, some even became uh, pluralists. Uh, one particular person in particular who studied uh, cities, and he just became straight out pluralist and never spoke of the past. And I would try to get him to say, "What? How'd you? Why'd you change your mind?" They would not speak of why they changed uh, their mind. But one of the uh, now we turn to uh, a couple of people that had stayed the course. That is, that they had stayed with uh, um, their views. But in the early 2000s, they said what the problem was, as you see on uh, one of the graphics. And that is, 
uh, James O'Connor, uh, he had said, well, we failed to anticipate the rise of neoliberalism and globalization and the reestablishment of U.S. political hegemony after the fall of the Soviet Union. In preface, you see what is my rhetorical question, but it's a serious statement. Can we ever really predict the future given the complexity of the equation that we are dealing with? And, and if we can't, then we can't have the kind of certainty that there's going to be decline or there's going to be this or crisis that is claimed by some of these theorists. In 2004, in a book that I could heart, heartily recommend to you, has several authors. It's called Enriching the Sociological Imagination, in which a lot of different authors uh, that appeared in the, in the Insurgent Sociologist um, wrote a reflection on their particular article in the uh, Insurgent Sociologist. And to his great credit, one of the people who was most prominent at that time and still is in sociology, Eric Olin Wright, the University of Wisconsin, still a Marxist, as far as I know, um, he uh, wrote a very fine statement on this that, that tells you what was going on at the time, which we can see in reflection. He said one of the tacit, tacit assumptions in much Marxist work in the early 70s was the conviction that the status turn, the turn to needing the state in capitalism, could not be dramatically reversed, which meant that no one seriously envisioned the wholesale demantling of the welfare state, the deregulation of Marxist, Markets, Marxist, Freudian slip, the markets, and the partial reversal of status capitalism as a way of coping with uh, crisis uh, tendencies. So that structural Marxism kind of disappeared or was not a major player within 10 years. But there was a second uh, major uh, criticism, the marginalization effect on, on power structure research, and that was the work of a then sociologist named Theda Scotchpool, and, uh, and there were many, many students, most of whom are political scientists in major universities, um, um, advocating the view that she and they developed. And, and they put a great emphasis on institutions. And they began their whole thing by saying, in an article that uh, Scotchpool wrote called Neo-Marxist Theories of the State. And in that, what she did with power structure research was to call us Marxists. And so this simple-minded version, power structure research in the hands of the structural Marxists, was now Marxism in the hands of Scotchpool. And so we had this simple-minded view. And then there was a more elegant view, which was the uh, structural Marxists, but they weren't quite right either. And so what we need is her view, which uh, did not involve uh, Marxism. But in any case, uh, she, they went forward, they studied a lot of, of different um, uh, um, legislative kind of programs, but I, I don't think that uh, they had it uh, very right. And by the um, 1992, uh, Scotch Pool was now fully in, in political science. Um, she then wrote something in which she basically became a pluralist. And uh, once again, you can, you can uh, uh, read that quote, uh, where she said that the lack of bureaucracies, that is, after all, there isn't a very strong state like she claimed there was, the lack of bureaucracies provides ample opportunity for voluntary associations, that's a pluralist word, and necessitates the creation of broad transpartisan coalitions, that's also a pluralist concept, and ultimately legislatures legislators that have to be assembled for each particular issue, which is classic pluralism. So I rhetorically ask, does this sound like pluralism? And it does to me. So what her great accomplishment was, that she had smited the Marxists. She was uh, she fully finished uh, uh, them off. And at the same time, she had returned us uh, to a version of pluralism that now uh, exists. So in any case, that's uh, what did us in the most. But I want to close very quickly by saying another ironic kind of thing has been uh, the big deal in the last 10, 15 years. Organizational theorists, mostly in business schools, but some in sociology, 
um, were very concerned to try to figure out why there would be interlocking directorates. And they, they, it wasn't enough that there were such and that they created a social cohesion. There had to be more to it. Uh, and so they went to a theory that might still be around, that you might still be taught, called resource dependency theory, which simply says that various things that are done by organizations are a way of decreasing their dependencies, making it so there's more certainty, uh, whether it's supplies or relation to government or whatever it may be. So they said interlocking directorates are a strategy for decreasing a firm's dependency. Well, that's detestable, and it's certainly got more muscle to it than just social cohesion, right? And a famous sociologist, Marxist sociologist at the time, Mark Mizrucci, who did some great early work on networks um, his, and how they changed over the 20th century, he thought resource dependency theory fit with Marxism. And so he said, I developed this theoretical argument in which I tried to synthesize the social class model uh, the resource dependence model. He liked it, first of all, because it legitimated the study of interlocks, the search for legitimacy within the mainstream. But he said, secondly, that he, he liked it because it's tied it to structural forces and it was consistent with Marxism. Now, this, this view was then faced with some uh, devastating empirical findings. One is, you would expect if there was a relationship that was important between two corporations uh, and the guy dies or retires, it was still all guys then, the, uh, they'd be replaced, right? And two or three studies were done and you looked at what were called broken ties. They weren't replaced with somebody from the same organization or even the same cluster of organizations. In fact, their social clubs predicted better <laughs> what, who was going to be appointed to, to uh, these positions. So at any rate, by 2017, two uh, network researchers looking back said resource dependency theory seemed of little use to explain corporate interlock. So that put them back at, at square one. And in terms of rethinking, uh, one of, of these people, a uh, business school uh, organizational theorist, uh, he decided that Corporate networks should be understood as small world networks. Now, a small world network is a fancy term uh, for a unique kind of network. It's not a random network, but it has a lot of small, close ties in it, a few large paths, and certain clusters, just like you saw a lot of these clusters already. And small world networks then have really good, basically they're really fast and good in uh, communication. And lo and behold, in writing about this in 2002, this person even stated that it was Mills, mind you, C. Wright Mills, that understood that corporate network was more or less an un unintended consequence. So he wrote, in contrast, uh, others, that means Mills we're going to give to, emphasize the unplanned nature of the network. Members of the corporate elite all seem to know each other as an unintended consequence of increasing economic concentration. And he cites Mills. So they then draw a conclusion that says that the upshot of these studies is that board interlocks provide, they are a fortuitous product. Uh, and, but they, they then provide this great network of people that know their stuff, that can pass information. And it's just like social networks, he said. So that made it, yeah. In other words, so we're back to uh, social uh, cohesion. Well, then they found a new problem. The same person, by 2016, said this was all dead. It was all dead because he and his uh, uh, student claimed that the network was much less dense, much less dense, sparse it's called, and that means there's fewer connections within uh, the network. Well, what it, what, uh, now I'm back to the first part of my uh, uh, remarks and, and coming close to the end of my remarks. And that is to say what you saw here with that 2011 network is a huge network uh, that uh, has in it uh, 2,500 plus organizations, I've already said, but it also has in it uh, 
a roughly, not roughly, exactly 9,121 uh, individuals are in that network. And the amazing thing is that 35% of those 9,121 people, that's all the people that sit on any of the boards in any of these organizations, 35% of them are on two or more boards. That's 3,200 people. Three or more boards, 18%. Four or more boards, 9%. Five uh, or more boards, 4.3%. Uh, now, you'll notice there just in passing, um, that it drops by half about each time, from 35 to 18 to 9 to 4. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the power elite. The power elite probably consists of 9,000 to 10,000 people uh, in 2,500 to 3,000 organizations. It has a sort of an inner circle of 3,000 to 3,500 that are real active, and maybe 1,000 who in any given year are uh, very, very active. They are the big wheels. They are the spokespersons on TV, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, we can find a lot of this, not all of it, but a lot of it and more, uh, in a first chapter that I wrote uh, for a book with 11 other authors uh, for the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Who Rules America, which is also another reason I'm so glad to be here because it is the 50th year the book has been out there. And this book is called Studying the Power Leap, uh, 50 Years of Power Structure uh, Research. Now in closing, I'd, I'd like to end with an ode. An ode to power structure research uh, that may fit with a familiar tune uh, that some of you may know, especially if you ever listen to oldies. Um, and it's spoken with, or I can't quite sing, or I'd sing it for you, had a man behind me, the whole thing. Um, and I close with this because it's the hope that, um, that power structure research can become a legacy of sociology uh, when my generation is long gone and not a relic. And it says, it's a great line from this song called Old Time Rock and Roll, it says, call me a relic, Call me what you will. Say I'm old-fashioned. Say I'm over the hill. Today's research ain't got the same soul. I like that old-time rock and roll. Thank you very much.